All right, so here I go, continuing with this heavier inking, because the bird is the black part. It's the night hawk of my concept. And the rabbit, the hair, is the light more open. If you want to, you can hide a signature in here somewhere. You do all kinds of things. Because remember, as a vector, it's all going to come in perfectly clean, whatever you do. Put my initials in here. Put the year. Aha. But mostly, I just have to tell myself, I'm worth it. I'm worth spending this long looking at a screen, building little feathers on the back of a bird. And since we're doing a theme of sleep, some of you have played with, with imagery with sheep you get to decide how detailed you want to be in the texturing of the sheep. Maybe you do it only with color. Maybe you do it with um, tons of little individual woolly curly hairs. But the beauty of doing this digitally is that it's separated on layers, right? And so I get to kind of change course at any time or race away at any time. But don't make uh, decisions for expediency, right? I'm sold on this approach, so I'm just gonna do it. And then if my deadline is getting close, I'm gonna call up my editor and show them what I have and say, is it possible to get maybe a day or two extension on this deadline? Because I have this approach. It's just taking me longer than, than I thought it would. And then the editor has two choices, right? They can say, well, the client really needs it by deadline. But I like the approach you're doing. So I just need you to stay up all night, you know, make this a priority. And then I'll make sure I don't ask anything big of you for the next two days while you recover. That kind of thing. Or they can say, oh, yeah, yeah, the client... I'll let the client know. They'll be thrilled to see your progress. And that's why acknowledging the deadline is so important to professional practice, because sometimes some jobs are just more, more labor than others to do the best work. And it's not always about just the jobs that pay you the most take the longest. You want to do what's right for the job. And as students, you're your own clients. So the only way you can really fail is by creating a piece that you don't really like, right? that you don't want in your portfolio. Because once you've submitted the assignment, it really doesn't matter to anyone anymore except for to you, whether you can actually make use of that assignment after it. Right, so most of the marks I'm making are going along the back of the bird, but when I want to darken it a little bit more, like show the dent of the spine, I'm going to do a cross <coughs> at the opposite direction to get some cross hatching. That will darken it a little bit more, give me a little bit more dimensionality. And whenever I'm working on something like this, 
I think now of those adult coloring books they sell that people like voluntarily buy and then spend hours on just coloring for meditation. And I realize that's exactly what I'm doing right now. But in the best world, I get paid to do this and I get a portfolio <coughs> piece out of it, right? <coughs> and that's why sometimes for this class, I'll say the tagline is making creators, not consumers, right? So we get to be the creators that make those coloring books with the same kind of meditative, useful, mindful point of view. And not have to spend our money on them. So by using blob brush in this way, there's really um, no end to how detailed you can get. And there are artists that like to build almost photorealistic images in, in Illustrator as vectors. The downside of that is it actually still takes up a lot of memory. Right? It doesn't actually save you much on the pixel version in terms of memory. But the big upside is that it's infinitely scalable and therefore way more versatile. So that this can be you know, made as a mural on the side of the building and each of these strokes could be the size of a car and they'd still have that same quality, right? So I am imploring you, even though we've been comfortable within Photoshop and Photoshop is what, what most kind of anime and uh, like manga studio and clip studio and a lot of programs are kind of based on Photoshop's raster image building, if you can get comfortable with Illustrator for certain things, and I'm just, just recommending it for line work, it can really expand the, the versatility and the potential of your digital artwork. Now, another way to think of your line work is Think of your spot illustration as being a design for a t-shirt, but what if that printer or that client can only afford a one color t-shirt, right? Then your line art is going to be that one color. So if this was printed on a white t-shirt, it's going to look like this. But if it was printed on a black t-shirt, then I can replace all this vector shape with white ink and it can print, you know, white on black. So even though we're not creating just a black and white illustration like we did the logo and then adding color, you want to like your line work enough that it, it reads on its own. So that if it was just a one color print job, you would still be somewhat satisfied with it. And that will, make, that will take a lot of the pressure off on the coloring side. Now the reason I'm investing so much time in the, the inking in this demo is because in the past, I'll usually go pretty quick on this phase and then spend a lot of time on the coloring. And it's really either or. When digital coloring was introduced into mass production in the 90s for things like comic books and for editorial illustration, um, a, a common mistake was that you would still have inkers doing a full inking job on things, kind of showing the shading on a nose of a character, for instance. And then you would have the digital colorist come in and then fully paint different values of skin tone around the nose. And when you layer both of those up, both the, the line art showing all the shading and the coloring showing all the values and shading, it's, it's overdone. It just doesn't look right. So basically you put a lot of your effort into your, your values in the inking, like I'm doing here on the bird, or you do it in the coloring, but you don't do it in both. And we'll talk about three different coloring approaches. The most basic being the easiest to print, which is flat color. 
And that's mostly what we do with our logo designs, right? You just pick one tone to fill in each shape. And to make that a little bit easier, that's why I made sure the outlines on both of my illustrations here are completely contained so that they're easy to um, select behind and select within and just fill with one flat color. So for instance, I might fill the, the bunny with pink, fill the bird with blue, and that would be a flat coloring job. And with enough attention to my line work, that might look pretty good. I don't know. The second type of coloring we'll do is called duotone coloring. And that's when you take the flat color, which is called the local color, the color that the thing is, and you split it into a light version of itself and a dark version of itself. So an example I often use is Charlie Brown's shirt is yellow with a black stripe across it. That's flat color. But if you move Charlie Brown into a different coloring scenario, like a Naruto episode, all of a sudden the yellow of Charlie Brown's shirt has to have, have a highlight and a shadow. And those are two different yellows on the same shirt. And that's why we call it duotone. You're splitting one local color into two distinct tones. And sometimes more than two tones. Because what if a train is then barreling down on Charlie Brown? Then you're going to have an even brighter yellow variation within that duotone coloring. And then there's full spectrum color, which means even though the local color of Charlie Brown's shirt is yellow, <laughs> if he's in a full spectrum scenario, that might mean that the shadows on that shirt might have purple in them. Or it depends on the color of the lighting because you'll get the complementary color in the shadows. Full spectrum coloring is more necessary in digital painting where you don't have outlines around the form. But some people like to use it in coloring with outlines as well. And we'll see some different examples. But the long and short of it is, the more complicated your inking, the less complicated your color should be. And that might give you a little solace if, like me, your technique's taking a while. We have about a half hour left today to try to get this line art done. So I'm going to go right for some of the hard stuff. The shaping of the, the feathers on the wing, for instance. But what I like about this approach is I have not gone back and had to erase or alter anything. This is very much an additive process. Where I just keep making the marks. And it's controlled enough that I can always just decide to do more. You'll also notice with digital art that you get better at techniques as you go. You get more comfortable with the tools. Practice matters. So it's OK if something new that you're doing, this is a, a new use of the blob brush for me. It's OK if it takes a while, because you, you learn more and more as you do it. OK, so I've got all these fine lines. I think I'm going to switch to a slightly bigger brush again. Just little changes from 4 to 7 is going to make a big difference in how much it covers and how quickly. And then I'll go back in and finish it with that little brush. But when I'm tackling areas of white, I want to be confident enough to be able to use something a little bit bigger, especially where it's darkest, like on the underside of the wing here. 